What central theme runs through all the Bible? How would you respond, Jesus, the plan of salvation? The cross, yes to all three, of course, but these three important topics unfold against another all-encompassing theme. The great controversy, this theme pervades the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, the great controversy began in heaven with Lucifer's rebellion against God. At the heart of this cosmic conflict is the issue of God's love. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome back to Whispering Hope Daily Lesson Study Review. Here with us, we are here the first Sunday of a new quarter, and this time around, we have not abandon the psalms but we've just rested down for a little while as we study the great controversy our, our topic for this quarter is the great controversy and our topic for this week is the war behind all wars this morning sunday morning we'll be studying war in heaven but before we go into our discussion we'll have our prayer by Elder Thomas and Elder Joseph will read for us our memory text. Good morning, everyone, and I hope and trust that you had a good night's rest and that you're ready for the task for today. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you again for your mercies that are renewed to us every morning. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to make choices today that will glorify your name. And as we open your words now, we pray that your spirit will guide our minds, give us clarity, understanding, and help us to be able to better appreciate the love that you have bestowed upon us, so that in doing so, we might make better choices in the war, in the conflict that we find ourselves in, knowing that you have already won the battle for us. So we want to thank you for your blessings, your favor upon us now, and we pray that your spirit will guide our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text for our lesson this week comes to us from Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. And it reads, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Amen, amen. So we're starting off our quarter strong. So we're going to look at our topics. Our topics again, topic for the week is the war behind all wars. And this morning, war in heaven. And you're going to share with us topic and subtopic context as well as any insights or main points that stand out to you from our memory text this morning. We're going to begin with Elder Thomas, and then Elder Joseph will come right after. All right, so we, we live in a world where there is always conflict, and it seems as if in order to have peace, you have to have war. There is war in order to bring peace. And the idea of the war behind all wars is basically where it all began. How is it that we uh, um, understand that we are created by God, yet we are so different and there is two different sides? And why should there be such conflict between, you know, these two sides? We are all human beings, we are all his creatures, yet we find ourselves on one side or another throughout our lives we constantly are on one side or the other and uh, so there is something that takes place or took place somewhere back in time that caused all this and so our topic war behind all wars and so we want to get to the point of where it all started and also when we look at our, our memory text or memory text actually tells us where it started and that there was a war in heaven and it pointed out two sides in a conflict and uh, one side was michael and the other side's captain was a dragon or, or uh, we would understand he's satan and in that war the dragon lost that fight and he was cast out of heaven and that war continued on earth. 
So we are involved in a war that started not on Earth, but continues on Earth. And it will continue until the time comes when God finally puts an end to it. And again, for today, our topic, War in Heaven, we'll just take a closer look at what happened in heaven, why this war began, and what exactly was this war. I guess some of those things we will look at. So it is strange for us when you think about a perfect place and a place that you think that there would not be any such wars. That war began right there. So it's, it's interesting that we will study that and hope that we will be able to better understand what's going on in our lives and in our world. Such a comprehensive thought. I don't think you'd expect me to comment, but I'll try to put my two cents here. The war behind all wars is say, it's saying, basically, I would want to bring into context here Newton's law, his third law that says for every action, there is a natural or equal reaction or an opposite reaction. And so as we delve into this quarter's lesson, we're going to see what is the action that has propelled us into all the other equal action or even more severe action. And why is it that we have to have a reaction to what is really happening? Is that there is a war. And when we look at this lesson, it says there was war in heaven. And that's why the lesson started out that, this week, because there is something that happened. And as a consequence, has resulted in all the chaos, the wars, the destruction that we have in our world today. I wouldn't want, want to go into it anymore because... As we go into the lesson, that is what our specific lesson for today will be looking into. And the passage for this week speak about that there was war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his, the dragon and his angel and there was no place found for them. Satan had become rebellious. Lucifer, in the mystery of Lucifer conjuring up or developing evil in his heart has caused problem for the world. Ellen White says that covetousness is the root of every sin that we commit. And we're going to go into the study of the lesson and we're going to discover that this week, how dangerous covetousness can be. It has plunged this world into chaos. Amen, amen. So we're going to dive right in. We'll ask Elder Thomas. You're going to read again our memory text with the addition of verse 9. So you'll be reading for us Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. And then the question here that you'll be answering for us is, what does this passage reveal about the freedom existing in heaven? and the origin of evil. So Revelation 12 from verse 7 to 9 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was there place found any more in heaven. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. We're looking at the, again, you talk about freedom, and when we talk about freedom, we recognize that God had created all his creatures with that freedom of choice, that thing we call choice. And, and today we have to battle, we have to fight for that inherent right to choose. And it, and it doesn't matter what we, we choose. We have that right to choose. We could choose right. We could choose wrong, but we have that right to make those choices. And you recognize that even in heaven, God had given his creatures the right to choose. That is because of love. Love does not force or coerce. And because God is love, he created all his creatures with a choice to respond to his love. And we can either respond to God's love by loving him back in obedience, or we respond in rebelling against God and fighting against God in disobedience. So, 
as we go deeper, we'll find out why was that choice made by Lucifer. But for now, as we look at the text, we recognize that that choice was made not only by Lucifer, but he obviously would have campaigned a word that we would know quite well in context of politics. He campaigned, you know, in heaven and he gained, you know, support by, by one third of the angels supported him with his argument. And they also had the freedom to choose whether they're going to accept and believe God or they're going to accept and believe Lucifer, what he was saying. And it, at a point in time came when that had to, a conflict took place where war broke out and in such a way uh, God had to eventually evict Lucifer and those who followed him and so they were cast down to the earth. So that's where we are from the text that we read. That's, there's more, but a basic summary. Amen, amen. So the follow-up here, a follow-up question, Elder Joseph. When Lucifer rebelled, in what ways could God have responded? <laughs> God could have cast out Lucifer. And so I'm going to recommend two books to our viewers this morning. The book, the Great Controversy, written by Ellen G. White, and the book, The Story of Redemption, that you could read. Either of them would give you a clear perspective of what really transpired in heaven. Now, if we were to look at the story just at face value in Revelation chapter 12, we would be tempted, many of us, without deep digging, to believe that Lucifer just came up and had an intellectual discussion with God and God was so impatient with him, but God kicked him out right away. It did not happen that way. I posit to you that Lucifer had persistently, he had enough time, as Elder Thomas said, to campaign against the government of God. In the story of redemption, Ellen White said it was the highest crime to rebel against the government of God. All heaven seemed in commotion. The angels were marshaled in companies, like, you know, in Antigua and Barbuda, they have Labour Party and you have the UPP, and you have in America, you have the Republican and the Democrats. People, angels had taken side. There were some who sided with God and said God is just and holy and does not have any ulterior motive and the, uh, there were others who were siding with uh, the, uh, satan who were saying god is unfair he only want he's a dictator he wants things to go with him uh, his way and you cannot disagree with him he also felt that god was unreasonable to have his son jesus in a more elevated position as the status as god while he was just an archangel and not a part of the Godhead. He had coveted Jesus' position. And so this had been going on, and God, at one point, the prophet of the Lord said, had reasoned with them, brought them together for discussion. But Satan, Lucifer at that time, would not hear. He had umpteen times. He had, was given an opportunity to reconsider his position and to repent, and God would have restored him. It is after many attempts by God. God is a gracious and loving God. And so God does not cut us off even in this world when we sin. Many of us, we know of the many sins. Some of them we have done in secret and nobody else but God knows. And But God is still merciful to us and gives us a chance. But there comes a time when grace has been spurned upon by those who are, it has been extended to. And when you have given up and said, I do not want God's grace, there is nothing that God can do to assist you. And that is what happened in heaven. Satan wanted to be like God. And there's one point I want to get in. I think when we read the other text, we're going to find ourselves having this discussion. But lest I get, Satan was well decorated in heaven with all those beautiful stones. And do you recognize that when people adorn themselves in this world, they walk with a certain level of ear and they think that they are on top of the world? Do you realize that when persons have wealth, they operate differently in this world? Do you understand that some people with education, they lose humility 
and become lifted up within themselves. Be careful, saints. Humble ourselves because we do not have anything of our own. It is God who has bestowed or entrusted our gifts to us. Amen, amen. I see that Elder Thomas is in agreement with you. <laughs> so, our next question, it asks us to do a comparison. So, we're going to have Elder Joseph read for us Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 to 15. And Elder Thomas will read for us Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. And then we'll come right back to our question. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 to 15. And I read in your hearing, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the kings of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, the burial, the oinks, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets, of thy pipes, was prepared in thee, in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee. So thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Isaiah 14, verse 12. To 14 reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Amen. Our question here is, what went on in the mind of this angelic being called Lucifer that led to his rebellion? And I know nobody can see into anybody's mind but God, but we're speculating here of what we thought went on in the mind of Lucifer. So we'll begin with Elder Joseph and then Elder Thomas will come right after. Hi, Sister Idel. I, I, I hate to surprise you this morning that we are not speculating the last aspect of the passage says that iniquity was found in his heart and elder thomas read the topics that, that from isaiah that said he had imagined in his mind that i will ascend above the most high it's like the political picture is a good picture to paint most politicians are not comfortable just being the representative Many of them are in the position of presidents and prime minister, etc. They want to be the head. And that is what happened to Lucifer. The text was clear about it. He wanted to be like God. He didn't want to just be like God. He said, I will ascend above. You, you get that? He was not just even content to be like God. He wanted to be more than God. And so he was not satisfied that Jesus, because get back and look at what Ezekiel 28, 5, 12 to 15 is saying. He said, when you think about it, he was made beautiful. He had giftedness of singing, of voice. The pipes were set in him. He could sing all the parts at the same time. And this was a gifted, he was the head and chief musician of the angelic host of choir. And he felt that he having all this position, walking up through the Garden of Eden, which is, was in heaven, and, and fire, all those fiery stones. He is he's depicting this godlike image, but he was not God. And he wa was not satisfied with what God had created him to be. And so the text was clear about that. There is no speculation. There is no conjecture. And even though the prophet of the Lord, Ellen White, didn't bring it out in clearer terms, to us it is clear enough in the bible both in ezekiel and isaiah that 
he had become prideish. And sometimes that is why we have trouble and problems in our churches, in our conferences, in our unions, because there are persons who have aspirations for power and they would go around and undermine the first elder, the head superintendent, the treasurer, and they will create their own stories and there would be people in the churches and in the conferences who are gullible when they speak things about the president or the secretary or whoever these persons in position are. And they will pick side and then there will be another person who has no motive and say, well, look, I do not see it the way you see it. And then there becomes a division and this unity in the church. And that is why God hates this unity. And no person, Ellen White even counsels that persons who promote this unity in church should not be given offices. And so we have to realize that when we take on these attributes and campaigning for offices in church and in certain spheres, that God does not appreciate when we behave in that manner. I don't know if I've made it clear enough, but I guess Elder Thomas will put on the cap. We have missed it. That's quite a mouthful, Elder. <laughs> That's quite a mouthful. And I see that you had more too, but I know we don't have all the time <laughs> so deep. However, the interesting thing is that it, it, it's good to have ambition, but uh, some people can be over ambitious. Uh, this is something that we saw with Lucifer, not satisfied after a while with the position that he had of course you quite rightly said he had such a great position but however Iodel, the scripture told us that, that iniquity was found in his heart uh, god is the one who is speaking to the prophets here and is telling them what is happening so when he spoke to ezekiel he told him exactly what was going on and because he knew the heart he said iniquity was found in lucifer's heart and and we understand about two mysteries and this is one of the mystery, iniquity. How was it that iniquity was found in the heart of Lucifer when he was created a perfect being? Uh, it is baffling, really. It is baffling. But somewhere along the line, we find him, Ezekiel said that, that his beauty had corrupted him, uh, his wisdom and his beauty. And, and I think when we look at, uh, Edson was saying, at us as human beings, taking on the spirit of Lucifer, we battle with the same thing. We, we, never, we never seem to be satisfied with success and position, except that we are at the top. And we, even Solomon, with all his wisdom, he was the wisest man, the Bible says, you know, and with all his wisdom, we saw Solomon fell and fell so far down that you wonder how is it that, you know, he got to that place. So it's the same spirit that of iniquity that works and it's not mentioned earlier about covetousness but what is so interesting is is how how is it possible that he could have become so covetous when he had so much he was the cup one of the covering cherubs he was so close to god yet still you know he wanted to be the scripture say like god and it's rightly say he wanted to be like god but like god is he wanted to be god he wanted to be the god so he would be above the creator god somehow i don't know how he expected to get there but that again tells us how corrupt this evil called covetousness that we want to we we tend to strive for something that we just cannot be because we envy somebody else who had the gift have the talent have whatever abilities that god gave them and we cannot be that but yet still we want to be that and take the place so it's quite interesting when we look at what happened in terms of the war in heaven and what happened took place with lucifer himself that we seek to be humble because pride and uh, you know success can and riches can really corrupt our minds in such a way that it would drive us to become rebellious against god and Finally, we know that that war broke out because of something that started in Lucifer himself. And Edson mentioned earlier that, that God would have given Lucifer chance again and again. Uh, but one of the things about that, 
was that here it is that there was a point when he seemed as if he would have wanted to repent. He recognized that, hey, look, he would have done evil. And God would have tested him in saying to him, well, hey, look, we, we can't take you back. I, I just can't take you back. And, and, and then you saw what happened afterwards that because he heard that, uh, you just cannot get back the place. He wanted to get back his place. I mean, when somebody repent and really sorry, and they would just want to be back in. You know, like the prodigal son, he didn't even want to be called a son. Father, just, just make me one of the higher servants. Just, I just want to be back home. But Lucifer was not that. Lucifer wanted back his position that he had before. <laughs> you know, if God was to take it back, he wanted back that position, which means that in his heart of hearts, he still would have had that desire. He would have probably settled for a little while and would be uncomfortable afterwards because he still had in his heart that he wanted that position. And so, so when, when we look at how we behave at times too, uh, it tells us the kind of war that goes on. It's the same war that goes on in our mind. Sometimes we, we say we're sorry for something. We recognize that we're wrong, yes. And we say we're sorry, but we just want to get back in a position so that we can continue or find another plan that we think would work better than the one we, we, we worked before, you know? So that war that takes place and we are caught up in it, and we have to choose which side we're going to be on. Amen, amen. So, with all that in mind and everything we've discussed, what lessons can you draw about God's character in his dealing with evil? God is merciful. It says, when we look at Jesus, Jesus said, Paul pens that while we were yet in trespasses and sin, Christ died for us. The, there's another text that says God does not delight in the death of the wicked. God is a merciful God. And the fact that God could have done anything, he could have just, he, he, only one third of the angels, he could have just wiped them out of existence and, and just continue heaven in its perfect bliss and save the earth and the world. Chaos. He could have done that when Adam and Eve sinned. There were only two persons in the world but god allow and when we look allow that to put to happen and said look it doesn't matter i will give my life to ensure that you can live in the peace and perfect state that i created you to be in and so in genesis 3 15 it says i will put enmity between thee and the woman and he promised there and then in that text that he would have sent Jesus to die. And that's if that isn't love, that God gave his son, God, to die, leave the splendor of heaven, and to come and to die, to be spat upon by, first, by sinners, his own creation, to be beaten with many stripes by his creation, to be mocked, to be ridiculed, to be insulted. Many of us don't take insults well. We don't take, we would not have taken that abuse that Jesus went through. We would have never done that. But Jesus bore it all when he did not have to, to ensure that we could be restored. You want more mercy than that when I look at my life and who I am and that God has been still so merciful to me. Psalmist David says that God covers his sin. I want to say the same thing as David said, God covers my sin and he presents me to the world as someone who is worthy to represent him and to speak on his behalf. What a mighty and merciful loving God. But you know, as I was preparing for this lesson, Sister Adel, I went through this stuff about covetousness that Ellen White wrote and she said, I saw that Satan had bade his angels to lay their snares, especially for those who were looking for Christ's second appearing and his commandment keeping people. Satan told his angels that the church were asleep. He would increase his power by line wonders and he could hold them. But he said, the sect of Sabbath keepers we hate, they are continually working against us and taking from us, our subjects, 
to keep the hated law of God. Go make them possessors of lands and money and junk with the keys of this life. It says, if you make them place their affections upon the things, we sh shall have them yet. It's about covetousness. You know, all of us sometimes say the world, the wicked people have the best cars driving. They live in the best house. They can wear the most fancy clothes. And we want to be like them. And we work, work, work. And we study, study, study. And do not carve out a part in our life for Christ. And then it's all about the money. And it's all about our accomplishment in this life so that we can stand large and in charge and stand out in this world. But God wants us to be humble. And when we humble and realize that we are undeserving of the grace that God has bestowed upon us, we will better serve humanity. And that's my contribution on this particular question. Yes, we're talking about God being merciful and gracious. And, and certainly one of the things that you recognize is that when we look at the creation of this world god spoke and it stood fast he commanded and it was established whatever god says his word was so powerful that it was manifested and uh, whatever he called into being so at the same same way i'm sure god could have spoken to lucifer and the angels and they could have just disappeared you know and that, that nobody would know anything about them again but god was gracious one of the things that might be troubling with that is that then why because the question is well, why would god allow sin you know to reign so long and and so many people are destroyed because of this and to our minds because we lack the wisdom of god because we are finite we can only see so far sometimes it's hard to understand how is it that that spells grace or how is it that that spells love but we are only a small part of the entire universe and the creation that god would have created there are so many other worlds and it had to be demonstrated so god would allow for the accusations that satan or lucifer would have brought against him that he was not just and he was not fear god had to allow for all the other worlds to see how fear he was and of course as edson would have mentioned if they did not see the grace and mercy of god before then they would have seen it in the christ his son who went to calvary that god would have gone to thus far because satan would have charged that god was not willing to do what he was telling his subjects to do but it was demonstrated in christ allowing himself to be tortured and humiliated and and took on the sin of the world dying on the cross giving up and it would have shown clearly the motive of lucifer how far he was willing to go for his you know side of the argument what he was saying he was willing to go as far as to crucify so when you say that he wanted to be god if he could he would have killed god because that that was his aim <laughs> you know and but all of that was demonstrated at the cross it showed the magnitude of god's love and mercy and it showed also the magnitude of evil and covetousness again as it's mentioned how deep and far it goes so when we look at um when we look at the cross when we look at god when we look at war and what is happening we can only recognize that god is so merciful he said to the man and the woman when they before they would have chosen to sin he said in the day that you eat you shall surely die and when they did he killed a lamb he killed a lamb suggesting that hey look he would take on the penalty he had already provided to take the penalty even though they had deserved to die and so likewise we too it's mentioned earlier sometimes our sin is is secret only between us and god but we deserve to die i mean if god was not merciful if we could just die in our sleep just like that or die in, in the act but yet still god allow us time to be able to and extend his hand in mercy and grace 
so that he can save us. So we talk about grace and look at the cross. We see nothing but love and grace extended by God. And surely, because we only know a little bit, because all that we talk about Lucifer in heaven is only a little bit of the story that we know. All that is revealed through inspiration. And so we only know a little bit of the story. But surely as God would have given us, granted us so much grace, you can imagine, God would have granted Lucifer the same amount of grace because he was just a creature just like us. And all God's creatures we recognize are very special and important to him. So he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He had the same ideal for Lucifer. But, of course, again, Lucifer chose to rebel and stay in the state that he that he had chosen. And we too, if we decide to do that, there is nothing that God can do other than to leave us to the reward of our choice. Amen, amen. So that has brought us to the end of our lesson this morning. And of course, with so much knowledge that you've shared with us, you must share with us your takeaway from our lesson this morning. Also, not just your takeaway, you're going to tell us what is your expectation from our quarter's lesson. I know we've studied the great controversy before, but what, what are you expecting different from our study this quarter? We'll begin with Elder Thomas this time around, and Elder Edson will wrap up for us. Well, I'm expecting us to explore as far and wide as possible all the inside workings of the conflict that we find ourselves in so that we can better appreciate you know the opportunities that we have to stand and to stand firm on the side of truth to be able to decipher between what is deception and what is true because we could very well be sincerely fighting you know with all our heart and our mind and fighting on the wrong side so i believe that as we go to this this quarter study we should be able to better appreciate and recognize the value of truth as is spoken by god and to appreciate that we have a part a very big role to play in this war that is going on and the takeaway from today for me is that we have to be so careful we really have to much introspection on how we respond to the gifts that god has given us in whatever field we might find ourselves in we look at how how are we behaving are we having the spirit and attitude of lucifer or are we having that humble spirit to really give god the praise and glorify him for what we're able to do or are we going to be like lucifer trying to say that we are self-made and uh, operate in that thing so that is something i believe for us to really take a serious look at as i go to look forward into this lesson the great controversy is something as elder thomas says even though we have gone through it so many times we only know a small portion of it and some of us even though we know the background of this story we sometimes become discouraged and sometimes we become angry with our brother in the church who find fault at us we become upset with the co-worker who try to don't press us and undermine us and the boss who tries to victimize us and forget that all the wars all these suffering are not of our own doing sometimes it is because of the greater conflict that is being fought in the background some of us we sp speak of job's trial and that it was a contest that he didn't even know what was going on for him and over him and sometimes that happens too in our life but we can lose faith even in that time and so what i'm hoping to take away from this for me personally is that god will increase my faith as an individual when i get a new and fresher perspective of the great controversy i also am looking forward that persons who are out there without hope and without christ may be brought to christ by us here on whispering hope or some other sabbath school platform that as we study this lesson that persons who don't know god will come to enter into a relationship with god so i'm looking for great things i'll be mostly sitting down and hearing elder thomas and pastor joseph and pastor Doles and dr white and on pastor lafleur all these guys and pa elder joseph and elder david and so forth 
expounding the word, all powerful people. I'm so happy to have them on Whispering Hope, promulgating the gospel to a dying world. I look forward for a powerful series, and I think that many persons will draw closer to God as we go into this series this quarter. Amen, amen, amen. And that has brought us to the end of our lesson. It was indeed a very interesting topic, and there's so much to look forward to in our upcoming studies. So we're glad that you could have joined us, that you're sticking with us as we continue to go through these many quarters of study. And we hope to see you tomorrow when our topic will be Lucifer Deceives, Christ Prevails. So share the link with a family, share the link with a friend, and join us as we continue to study together.